Hello, and welcome back to That's English. Oh, oh, hello. Ashley, you're late. Where have you been? Oh, I'm sorry. I had to move out of my flat in a hurry. What? I, I can't stay there anymore. Why? What happened? Oh, I argued with my flatmate about space. He filled all my cupboards with his things. Unbelievable. Oh, dear. And anyway, the maintenance costs are very high. We have to pay for all the repairs. It's ridiculous. Well, you'll be interested in today's documentary. It's about houseboats. Hmm. Houseboats, eh? Perhaps I could try renting one. You could. I hope you don't get seasick. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. But while I look for a new place, could I stay with you for a few days? Well, uh, oh, OK. But don't forget, I've got a tiny baby who cries at night. Oh, I'm not worried about that. Thanks so much. Uh, no problem. Well, let's find out more about life on a houseboat. While you watch the documentary, look for the answer to this question. According to Tony Shaw, why do people choose to live on a boat? Hmm. Let's see. Some people in Britain live in unusual places, like lighthouses, windmills, or medieval towers. Or in strange houses such as this one. Or in a place like this, with a great view of the River Orwell. There are lots of rivers, lakes and canals in Britain, and over 15,000 people live on them. There are people who decide to live on houseboats. They travel up and down the canals and stop for short or even long periods in one location. We came to Broxbourne to speak to Paul Scrutton, who lives on a houseboat. I've lived here for a year. I used to live in the city centre, but I got tired with the noise, traffic noise, pollution. There's nothing else better than waking up in the morning on the water. It's great seeing the wildlife so close, the ducks, the swans. Best of all, if I want to change a view, I can move on to a new location. Of course, there are certain changes to your lifestyle when you decide to live on a houseboat. The first thing you have to do is get used to the movement of the water, especially when you're trying to sleep. There's not much room, so when you are shopping, you have to think carefully about how much to buy. It's a great sense of community, because we've all chosen that great lifestyle. Everybody is friendly and helps each other. We are usually quite independent, and of course we love being on the water. We enjoy living somewhere quite different to where most people live. And we enjoy a lifestyle that is close to nature and quite bohemian. I would say we were quite romantic. Tony Shaw works for an estate agent which specialises in renting and selling houseboats. She explains why people choose this type of home. Well, it's much cheaper than buying a flat and maintenance costs are also lower. But life on a boat is not always easy. Generally, houseboats don't have a lot of storage space. And when there is a storm or bad weather, a few people feel a bit seasick. However, once the sun comes out, many people come up with their own creative solutions. Sometimes you can have a garden, although most people usually have plants on the boat. So, if you have a romantic and independent personality, why not choose a home that reflects it? This lifestyle was perfect for me. Oh, what a romantic way of living. Wouldn't you like to live on a houseboat, Annabel? <laughs> no, it's not very practical for me now I have a baby. Oh, that's a good point. 
There's not much storage space to keep clothes. And you have to be very tidy. Hmm. Maybe it's not such a good idea after all. Yes. Anyway, now let's check the answer to the question. According to Tony Shaw, why do people choose to live on a boat? Let's watch it again. Tony Shaw works for an estate agent which specialises in renting and selling houseboats. She explains why people choose this type of home. Well, it's much cheaper than buying a flat and maintenance costs are also lower. So the answer is, it's much cheaper than buying a flat and maintenance costs are also lower. I could be one of the 15,000 people who live on the water, but I'll look at other places too. What sort of thing are you looking for? Well, I'd love a detached or semi-detached house, but I'm not rich enough. I'm not well off. So I'm hoping to find a loft apartment. Well, don't take too long to decide. Now, let's find out about housing in other countries. Let's listen to the answers to this question. What kind of accommodation do most people in your country live in? I believe the most common um, accommodation for people to live in here are flats and houses. Housing in Jamaica is very dependent on social status. So a lot of poor people will live in ghettos, in kind of ramshackle huts. Uh, normal people will live in a one-storey house and richer people will usually have the two-storey house. The working class lives in, live in apartments and the rich, well-off people live in palatial mansions, bungalows, and the poor <laughs> and the, some, some, some people live in the slums as well. There are so, certain um, sections in India which are like slums and people live under plastic roofs. We've got all different types of houses, you know, from just single houses to semi-detached, detached, bungalows, flats, high-rise flats that go miles up in the sky. Most people who live in the suburbs would live in a detached sort of one to two level house. Um, if you're living in the cities, you'd be more likely to live in a flat. What a variety of accommodation, from high-rise flats to bungalows. And from posh or elegant mansions for the rich to slums and huts for the very poor. Now we're going to see some more unusual houses in today's episode of That's Britain. Nigel visits some very old houses at the Weald and Downland Museum. While you watch, see if you can answer this. In the 15th century farmhouse, how many bedrooms are there and where are they? Let's watch. Hello! Today I'm in the South Downs National Park in a snowy place that has houses from many different centuries. We're going to find out how people used to live. This is the Weald and Downland Open Air Museum. There are more than 50 buildings from different parts of the country. They've been transported here and rebuilt. Let's have a quick look round. I'm here with Julie, who works at the Weald and Downland Museum. Why do people come to the museum? A variety of reasons. Uh, people come to learn from our buildings and our collections. People come as families to enjoy the site and the special events that we run. Great, thank you. Let's start at the oldest house. This cottage is from the 13th century. The walls are made of flint and this type of roof is called a thatched roof. This is a much bigger house. It was built in the early 15th century and it used to be a farmhouse. 
Oh, this is a nice big living room. As you can see, the room was heated by an open fire. Over there at that end are the family's rooms. There's a bedroom downstairs and another one upstairs. Let's take a look. Oh, this is a nice spacious bedroom. Ah, oh, look, a cot for the baby. This is Winkhurst Tudor Kitchen. It's from the early 16th century and was used for cooking food and for making beer. Uh, excuse me, uh, could I ask you a quick question? Uh, yeah. What do you think of this old style of kitchen? Well, I don't think it would be that easy to cook with some of this equipment. In fact, I think I've missed my microwave. Oh, <laughs> me too, I have to agree. I'm here with Vic, who volunteers for the museum. Vic, could you tell me about your costume? I'm wearing replica Tudor clothes made of two natural materials. Linen, my shirt is made of linen. Um, it goes from there down to my knees. Uh -huh. The rest of the clothing, of course, is wool. Thank you very much. OK. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this brief visit. Next time, we're going to Rochester and Chatham in Kent. See you there. Bye. Well, that's a great idea. Collecting buildings from all periods and places and rebuilding them in one big outdoor museum. Oh, the farmhouse is fabulous. Yes, but I couldn't live there. Why not? There's, there's a cot for the baby. No electricity for my hairdryer. Ah, oh, of course. Anyway, our question was, in the 15th century farmhouse, how many bedrooms are there and where are they? Let's watch it again. Over there at that end are the family's rooms. There's a bedroom downstairs and another one upstairs. Let's take a look. Oh. So there are two bedrooms, one downstairs and another one upstairs. Yes. Of course, I know why you couldn't live there. Why? You wouldn't look good in those Tudor clothes. What? I think I'd look great in that cap. Yes, yes, you'd look lovely. Well, that's all we've got time for. See you next time for more That's English. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.